All right. That helps him out. When they lose the audio, he can then go back and sync it with that. So, Okay. Uh, we're going to finish 1 Corinthians 15 today, Lord willing. Next week, we'll finish the book of Corinthians, chapter 16. A week after that, uh, the plan is to begin a study of the book of James. So that's what's in store. Doing I'm doing James, yes. I don't know if to say that. Is that so people can flee? <laughs> All right, 1 Corinthians. Let me r race through and remind you what's going on. The first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul emphasizes, he emphasized that the gospel includes the resurrection of the dead and buried Christ. And then in verses 12 to 19, he asks how, in light of that fact, some in the Corinthian church can deny that Christians will be resurrected. See, the future resurrection of Christians is so inextricably tied to the resurrection of Christ that to deny the one is to deny the other. And then in verses 20 to 28, Paul declares that Jesus has in fact been raised from the dead and is the first fruits of the end time resurrection. But the resurrection secured by Christ, it occurs in a certain order by God's, God's plan and God's will. First, Christ is resurrected, and then at his second coming, those who are in him are resurrected. That's when Jesus will complete his rescue of fallen creation, will bring to fulfillment or completion his victory over sin and all corruption in these things, this victory that he achieved by the cross. He'll do that by purging from creation all sin and all of its consequences, the last of which is death itself. That's the last enemy to be destroyed. And having fully accomplished his mission, you see this picture where the son then presents or delivers to the father, offers up to the father this restored or rescued kingdom in which there's nothing but grateful and loving loyalty. All disruption, all rebellion, all things that are fragmented have been purged out. And then you have this eternal kingdom. And then he is the perfectly faithful son, shares with the father in the rule of that eternal kingdom. Then in verses 29 to 35, Paul offers as an additional argument for the truth of the resurrection, the fact that some in Corinth were in part motivated to be baptized by their belief they would share in the resurrection with Christians who had died before them. And he also points to his death-defying conduct that testifies to his certainty that the resurrection is true. You see, Jesus changed the calculus about death. He changed that calculus by going through death and returning victorious over it. Now, when we ended, we were looking at verses 35 through 44. I want to read that again, and then I'll get back to where we were. He says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? With what sort of body do they come? Foolish man, what you yourself sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what do you sow? You do not sow the body that is going to be, but a naked seed, perhaps of wheat or one of the rest. But God gives a body to it as he has willed. And to each of the seeds, he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same flesh. Rather, there is one flesh for men and another flesh for animals and another flesh for birds and another for fish. And there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly ones is one kind and the glory of the earthly ones is another. The glory of the sun is one kind. The glory of the moon is another. The glory of the stars is another. Indeed, star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in a perishable state, it is raised in, imper in an imperishable state. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. And as if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now to those who challenged the idea of the resurrection by questioning how it could happen, well, Paul, after calling them foolish, 
He says our bodies will be transformed analogously to the way a planted seed is transformed into something different. It's planted one way, but it is given a different kind of body. There's a transformation that is involved there. And he also points, points them to the fact that God has already demonstrated the ability to make different kinds of bodies that are adapted to different kinds of existence. The resurrection of the dead, he says, it follows those same principles. Just as you see there is a transformation, just as you see God has already demonstrated the ability to create different kinds of bodies suited and adapted to different existences, the resurrection goes along those lines. So when you ask, well, how can he do this? You have it sitting right in front of you how he can do that. And then Paul says in verse 44, he says there that our natural body that is sown our body that's subject to death and thus is buried and planted, it will be raised a spiritual body. Now, right when we ended, I was explaining that the phrase spiritual body does not mean the raised body will no longer be physical, that that body will consist of spirit. And I want to emphasize that because I think a misunderstanding of that leads people off the mark it leads them away by swallowing a false idea about that they then begin building on a false idea so that's why I'm emphasizing this now I had just begun to talk about this when I was so rudely interrupted by the bell last week so I'm just gonna start over because I had just begun here now the spiritual body does not mean the raised body will no longer be physical that's what I want you to think about why think that why say that all right, I want to see if I can drill this in. All right, in the first place, Paul doesn't say that our natural body, he doesn't, he doesn't say that our body, he says it'll be raised a natural body, he doesn't say it'll be raised a spirit. It will be raised a natural body. He doesn't say it'll be raised a spirit, a non-physical entity. He says it will be raised a spiritual body. Our natural body he says, will be raised a spiritual body. As I pointed out last week, physicality is an inherent aspect of Paul's use of the word body when he's speaking of persons. And I gave you this quote from Robert Gundry from his influential book, Soma in Biblical Theology. Physicality is inherent in Paul's use of body. He says, contrary to all this, however, runs Paul's exceptionless use of Soma for a physical body. Had Paul wanted to portray the resurrection in any other fashion than in terms of physical bodies, he would not have used soma. So the first thing when you say, well, look, spiritual body doesn't mean the raised body will no longer be physical. Why, why do you think that? I think that because body is inherently physical. Okay, and he doesn't say raised spe a spirit. He says it's raised a spiritual body. Okay, the second reason is that the adjective spiritual doesn't mean that the noun it modifies lacks physicality, that it's something composed exclusively of an immaterial or a non-corporeal spirit. In fact, Greek adjectives ending in ikos, like you have here, pneumatikos, sukikos, pneumatikos, Greek adjectives ending in ikos rather than in inos, those adjectives, they normally denote mode of existence rather than substance. So you get somebody like N.T. Wright in his book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, saying the adjective, pneumatikos, describes not what something is composed of, but what it is animated by. It is the difference between speaking of a ship made of steel or wood on the one hand and a ship driven by steam or wind on the other. It's like when we speak of an electric car. We do not mean a car that is made of electricity. We mean a car that is powered by electricity. You see, otherwise you would wind up with something that's incoherent. Given the physicality of body, 
if you say that spiritual means that it's composed of something non-physical, well, then you're saying I have a non-physical physical. And it would be incoherent. But that's not what the, that's not what the adjective means. It means it, it draws its mode of existence. And you can see that because Paul uses the adjective spiritual elsewhere in 1 Corinthians in a way that shows it doesn't mean the noun it modifies lacks physicality. That the noun it modifies is composed solely of spirit. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, you have the same two adjectives that he uses in 1544. Paul uses those same two in contrasting the natural man from the spiritual man. And he certainly doesn't mean that the latter is non-physical. Right? Is, is that not obvious that he doesn't mean that the person is non-physical? When he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, that he could not speak to them as spiritual men, but as to fleshly ones, he's not referring to their physicality. When he says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4, when he refers there to the manna and water provided during the exodus and during the wilderness wandering period, when he refers to them as spiritual food, and spiritual drink, he's not saying the manna and the water that was provided were non-physical. That's not what he means. And when he asks in, in chapter 14, verse 37, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or is spiritual, he is not asking about their physicality. Okay, so when I say, well, when, when you look at this, he says spiritual body, that he's not saying something that is non-physical. First is the inherent physicality of the word body. Second is the adjective speaks about mode of being or existence and not what it's composed of. And that's a good thing or otherwise you'd run into this incoherence. Right? So that's second. And the third thing is that the parallel phrase, you have, he, he contrasts, he says you have a sukakos body and a pneumatikos body. Okay? So we have this natural body and spiritual body. So the parallel phrase that he uses, natural body, it shows that spiritual body, that it's not intended to refer to a non-physical entity composed solely of spirit. You see, the adjective sukikos, on? Am I too stupid to work this? Ah, there we go. Okay, you, you see here this adjective, Sukikos, okay, which is translated natural. You see, I've tried to make it natural body, spiritual body. I've tried to bring them down so you can follow what I'm saying. But I want you to see that the way he uses natural body reinforces this idea that when he speaks of spiritual body, he's not speaking of a lack of physicality. Now, how is that, all right? So when he talks here, when he, when he speaks of this natural body, when he says here that adjective sukikos, which is translated natural, it's a cognate, meaning it's related to the noun suke. So you have suke, right, which means soul, and then the adjective form is sukikos, which is soulish or natural. You say, well, if it means soul, how do you get to natural? That's why I explained this down here. It says soulish as animated by ordinary human life and thus as natural. That's why all the translations, except the Revised Standard, which goes off in a bad direction, uh, recognize this as natural. Okay, so you have suke, and then the adjective form is sukikos, and suke means soul, and yet the phrase sukikos body obviously doesn't describe something non-physical. When you're looking over here, you don't say about the body that's sown, the natural body, you don't wind up saying, well, natural body means a body that's composed only of soul and therefore is immaterial. You don't say that because you recognize how the adjective is functioning. Well, that's the whole point of the parallel. As you recognize that sukhakas body does not mean a body that is composed only of soul and is therefore non-material, non-physical. Well, when you then look at the parallel phrase, pneumatikos body, you should recognize that it is functioning in the same way and it does not mean a body that is composed only of spirit. Okay, let me, here's, here's what James wears. Here's how we 
explains the significance of that. He says, and this is in his 2014 article, he says, if soma pneumaticon, if spiritual body in this context describes the composition of the future body as a body composed solely of pneuma, solely of spirit, its correlate soma sukikan, natural body, would per force describe the composition of the present body as a body composed only of soul. Paul would assert the absence of flesh and bones not only from the risen body but also from the present mortal body as well. The impossibility that Sukakas here refers to the body's composition rules out the notion that its correlated adjective pneumaticas refers to the body's composition. Contrasted with Sukakas, the adjective pneumaticas must similarly refer to the source of the body's life and activity, describing the risen body as given life by the spirit. Okay, so when you say that, when I say to people that the, the spiritual body does not mean a body that is composed of spirit and non, he doesn't say spirit. Body's inherently physical, the adjective functions that way, and you have the parallel of natural body. Okay, so I give you these things so you will know the reasoning behind that. If I just told you that, you'd say, what does he know? I'm trying to get you to see the reasons for this. But then I want you to recognize that what I'm saying to you, that the phrase spiritual body, that this is not something you see that, that, that carries a sense that it lacks physicality. I want you to recognize that because the contrast the contrast here, it's not between physical bodies and spiritual bodies, as though the contrast is physical, non-physical. That's not the contrast. The contrast is natural and spiritual. Natural and better, supernatural. You see, it's not physical, it's not physical, non-physical. It's natural, supernatural. That's the contrast that's being there. You see, the natural bodies, the contrast is between natural bodies, those common to mankind, and bodies that have been transformed so as to be suitable to the eternal, for the eternal state. They're spiritual, not in the sense of non-corporeal, not in the sense of composed of or made of spirit, but in the sense of supernatural, in the sense they are imperishable, they are glorious, they are powerful. They are supernatural in that sense. You see, that's what's, that's what's going on. And now, the fact spiritual body does not mean something is non-physical. When you hear this, I don't know how this strikes you. You may think, this is quirky, this is odd. Let me dissuade you from that, okay? What I am saying to you is not the least bit novel. It is not the least bit eccentric. It's not odd. It's not quirky. Now, when I say that, I have to back that up. Let me show you. This is recognized by a wide range of scholars. Let me give you a few of them. You say, why do you read these people to me? I'm reading them to you now so you will understand that when I tell you that this is not novel, you'll say that I can go and pull off from the books in my house, I can pull off this many people, and I can get more. But I want you to hear what they say, okay? Here's, here's a Mark Taylor, this is the commentary, the New American Commentary, published in 2014, well-known scholar. You know, they don't get people who aren't recognized working in the field to, to write these commentaries in these series. Mark Taylor is somebody, he says, the terms natural and spiritual in this context do not mean material and immaterial, but rather describe the present earthly body and the future transformed resurrection body shaped in the image of Christ. Now notice I didn't simply go to these people and read them because then you'd say, well, I don't believe them, I believe the Bible. I went to the Bible, I explained why in context it means this. Now I'm showing you what I'm saying is not novel. Okay? Michael Gorman, who's a, a, a well-known Pauline scholar, this is kind of where he focuses his efforts. In his book, Reading, Reading Paul, which was published in 2008, he says the phrase spiritual body does not mean non-physical, but rather spirit enlivened. Ben Witherington, he's a very well-known evangelical scholar, he says spiritual body does not mean a body without substance, but a body animated and vivified 
by God's Spirit. Gordon Fee, in his commentary, on, in the New International Commentary on the New Testament series, he says, the adjectives natural and spiritual do not describe the stuff or composition of the body. Rather, they describe the one body in terms of its essential characteristics as earthly on the one hand, and therefore belonging to the life of the present age, and as heavenly on the other, and therefore belonging to the life of the spirit in the age to come. It is spiritual, not in the sense of immaterial, but of supernatural. See, and I think that's the contrast. Alan Johnson, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians in the InterVarsity series, he says, the ikos ending uh, on the adjective signals an ethical or dynamic relation, not a material one. So the words denote not substances, but modes of being, okay? Where you have sukikos punumatikos, the ikos adjectives. He says, therefore, the proper distinction between the two types of embodiments is not material or physical versus immaterial or non-physical, but a body suited for the mere functioning of the suke, the life principle, a body destined because of sin to die and to corrupt in contrast to a body suited for the full functioning of the Holy Spirit, the imperishable resurrection body. And the Stephen Davis, this is in the Oxford Handbook of Eschatology. Not exactly an unknown source, the, uh, published by Oxford University Press. The Oxford Handbook of Eschatology, published in 2008. Paul is not denying that resurrected bodies are physical, but is denying that they are frail and corruptible like natural bodies. So Paul's notion is that when God raises us, God will change our bodies into spiritual bodies, bodies controlled by the Holy Spirit, bodies fit for the kingdom of God, but they will still be bodies and they will be continuous with because they are the result of changes in our old natural bodies. And we have James Ware in that 2014 article that I've mentioned a number of times that he published in New Testament Studies, that journal. He says, both contextual and lexical evidence thus indicate that the phrase soma pneumaticon, spiritual body, in 1 Corinthians 15, 44 to 46, does not refer to a body composed of material pneuma, spirit, but to the fleshly body endowed with imperishable life by the power of the spirit. Although the expression soma pneumaticon is unique here in Paul, the concept of the spirit as the agent of resurrection life is a major theme within Paul's theology. Romans 8, 9, 11, 23, and you can see the text written there. Within this theology, the work of the spirit in those who belong to Christ will culminate in the resurrection when the one who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. So I give you all of that to say that when I tell you that this idea of spiritual body, that if you have read this saying, a body composed of spirit and therefore something non-physical, non-material, I am suggesting to you, you have misread it. Okay, and I give you these people to show you that when I make that suggestion, you know, this happens to me. I, I read around a lot and I know things about it and I'll say something to somebody and they'll act like it's bizarre. You know, I had one time, one time I was talking about this stuff. A guy said, what's that? Some, is that some kind of Harding doctrine? I said, no, it's standard Christian. No, it's not. And I just want to shoot myself. You know, I, so I, I'm, I'm letting you see that it's not the least bit novel what I'm telling you. Now, the continuity between the present body and the, there is continuity and discontinuity. Paul's going to emphasize the discontinuity in a second. But the continuity between the, between the present body and the resurrection body, it sometimes causes people concern. It causes them to wonder, will God be able to resurrect those bodies that have been incinerated or have decayed to dust and scattered or have been consumed as nutrients by other living beings? Now... To that, all I'll say, well, Paul says, when they say, well, how can this be? Paul says, a foolish man. But to that, what all I'll say is that the God who spoke a universe into existence, he can handle the task. I'm convinced he can handle it. Indeed, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 13, it speaks of the sea. 
The sea giving up those who had died in it. Giving up those. So now you think of the sea. And how things are just going to disintegrate in the sea. But he says there the sea gives up the dead who died in it. So however disintegrated. Or however dispersed human remains may be. They're not beyond the power of God. To be taken up into the great transformation of the resurrection. So I want to say that because when you talk this way, people start asking the same kinds of questions. How can that be? How can that happen? And my confidence is that the God who speaks the universe into existence can handle the job. And he'll do it. Now also the continuity between the present body and the resurrection body, it doesn't mean that bodily deformities, bodily disabilities that you see some people that have and struggle with, that they will carry over. You say, well, why do you think that? Well, I think that because at his first coming, Jesus healed the blind, the lame, the sick, the crippled, the deformed. And we sometimes say, well, why didn't he do that for everybody? Because on his first coming, it wasn't the time to universalize these things. He did those things as, an, as a demonstration of what the consummated kingdom would be like. And so he shows that these things which are ultimately attributable to Satan, directly or indirectly, you see, deformities and all of that stuff is the work of Satan, and nothing that is the work of Satan will survive into the consummated kingdom of God. So when you talk this way, people sometimes say, well, you know, I, th I think about the woman who was crippled for 18 years, held a prisoner by, by Satan. Okay, and what's Jesus do? He fixes it. You see, that's how it's going to be. So I, I want to say that to you. Now, 44, 45 to 49. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But the spiritual was not first. Rather, there was the natural than the spiritual. The first man is of the earth, made of dust. The second man is of heaven. As is the man of dust, so also are those of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are the heavenly ones. And just as we bore the image of the man of dust, so we will also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, Paul here in 45 to 49, Paul at the end of 44, he asserts that the existence of a natural body, that that presupposes the existence of its counterpart, a spiritual body. If there is one, there's also the other. He then makes a statement in the beginning here of verse 45 that supports or conforms to that assertion, there, to that assertion at the end of 44. He makes that point. You see, he says also, but to appreciate his point, it helps to, to know something of the Greek that he's using, which I, I gave you some of that a minute ago, and also to be aware of a literary device known as a synecdoche, okay, where part of something is used to represent the whole. And you say, uh-oh, that sounds tricky. It's not tricky at all. When we say all hands on deck, we mean people. If I'm in the parking lot and I say those are some nice wheels, I mean the car, right? I'm using part of it to refer to the whole. And we do that kind of thing all the time. Okay, Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 in the Greek translation, the Septuagint. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, Adam became a living suke. He became a living suke. Now the Greek word can refer to a person's soul in distinction from their body you see that for example in revelation chapter 20 verse 4 but it also can refer as a synecdoche to the entire person the being that includes a soul and it clearly functions that way in genesis chapter 2 verse 7 which is why most english translations render that phrase in in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, they say Adam became a living person or a living being, even though the word is suke, soul. Now, I left it that way so you can see the play between soul and spirit. But they do that because they recognize the meaning is Adam became a living person. He became a living being. But it literally says he became a living soul. Now, suke, as I mentioned a minute ago, that's the noun cognate, right, the related noun 
of the adjective sukikos, which is the adjective that's used in natural body. All right, he became a living suke, sukikos body, natural body. He became a living suke. So I hope you can see what Paul is doing here. The implication of the word suke as a synecdoche, standing for he became a living person, the implication of that for the person is that the first man, Adam, became, that he became a living person, that implication is that Adam provided a natural, a sukkakos body for his people. So Paul says the first person became a living suke. The implication is the living suke provided a sukkakos body. And then he goes on and he says, the last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving panuma. He became a life-giving spirit. Now, the Greek word can refer to a person's spirit in distinction from his body, just like is true of soul. But it also can refer as a synecdoche to the entire person. And it functions that way in the second part of verse 45 in parallel to how suke functions. We know suke is functioning as a synecdoche for the person. You can just go look at the translations. He became a living person. He became a living being, even though it says living soul. So then in parallel to that, we can see that when he speaks of Jesus became a life-giving spirit, says he became a life-giving person, but using a different element for the synecdoche. Now, why? In the one, he uses suke. He became a life-giving suke. Why? Because what flowed from that was a sukkakos body. Jesus becomes a life-giving panuma. Why? Because what flows from that is a pneumaticos body. Suke, sukikos, panuma, pneumaticos. That's what he's doing. He's letting you know that th those who flow from the man of dust get from him a natural body. Those who are, in, who are connected to Jesus, the life-giving spirit, get a spiritual body, which is just what he said. Okay, he, is just, he just talked about that. Now, Paul says there's an, there's an order to the appearance of the natural body and the spiritual body. He says the natural comes first in that the first man, Adam, who was made from the dust. So the natural does come first. Adam comes and then later comes Jesus. The natural comes first and then the spiritual. So he says that, that the natural comes first in Adam who was made of dust and then came the spiritual in the second man, in the, second, in, in the second man, Christ, who came from heaven. Okay, so those of dust, those who descend from Adam, who descend from the man of dust, the man who was made of dust, they are like the man of dust. How? In that they share his naturalness. You see, they share his naturalness. And those of heaven who are like, who are, those of heaven who are born of the man of heaven, they are like the man of heaven. Well, how are we like the man of heaven? We share in his supernaturalness. You see, so you have this, you have this plan. First the natural, then the spiritual. It happens first Adam, then Jesus. And it happens in us also. Because we who are the descendants of Adam first share what? Natural body. And then what? What do we share? The supernatural body of Jesus in the resurrection. Natural spirit. Natural spirit. Okay? So that's the point that he's making. This plays out in the same order. We first bore the image of Adam in the weakness of our natural bodies. Corrupt. Weak. Subject to death. We first bore that, but we will in the resurrection bear the image of Christ in the glory of our resurrection bodies. You see, as is the man of dust, so also are those of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also are the heavenly ones. And just as we bore the image of the man of dust, so will we also bear the image of the heavenly man in our resurrection. Raised with a spiritual body, immortalized, glorious, imperishable. We were subject to death. He was subject to death. He's raised. Death no longer has mastery over us. We too will be raised. Death no longer has mastery over us. You see, that's, that's what he's doing. That's the parallel there. Now, 50 to 57, he says, Now I say this, brothers. This is another one of these things that gets people off track. He says, I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Pay attention. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, 
but we will all be changed. In an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet, for a trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable thing must put on imperishability and this mortal thing must put on immortality. And when this perishable thing puts on imperishability and this mortal thing puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled, death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, if, that, if you don't love that. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin, and the power of death is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's load here, but boy is it good. Now Paul, he concludes his argument here about the resurrection body by stressing the necessity for transformation. He stresses the necessity for transformation. The statement that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God does not mean that no physical substance can enter the eternal state. We sometimes see it that way. Again, I'm suggesting to you that is a mistake. Paul was speaking of flesh and blood as presently constituted, as subject to weakness, as subject to decay, as subject to death. Our bodies cannot enter the eternal state, cannot enter the consummated kingdom of God without first being transformed into imperishable, glorious, powerful, immortal bodies. Once again, is this odd? Is this quirky? It is not. Stephen Davis, Oxford Handbook of Eschatology. When Paul says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, he's not saying that a body, the very term Paul uses, soma, implies physicality cannot enter the kingdom of God, but that a body that has not yet been transformed by God via resurrection cannot do so. Craig Blomberg, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, I hope you know the name Blomberg, he's done quite a bit. Flesh and blood, in verse 50, was a stock idiom in Jewish circles for a mere mortal, and does not contradict what Paul has already stressed, that resurrection experience is a bodily one. Jesus referenced to having, see for example, Jesus referenced for having flesh or compare flesh and bones in Luke 24, 39. Mark Taylor in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, the phrase, the phrase flesh and blood refers to the earthly human body which is subject to sin and death. David Garland in his commentary, the first assertion that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of, cannot inherit the kingdom of God is explained by the second in ways that any Greek reader could understand. Flesh and blood represents what is corruptible, and what is corruptible cannot stake a claim on what is incorruptible. So he's talking about the need for transformation. This body, you can guess this body can't go in there, right? I mean, this body that's subject to decay and all of that, it must be transformed. It must be immortalized. It must be eternalized before it enters into the eternal state. It has to be changed. Like the seed must be transformed. That's what he's talking about. Here's uh, N.T. Wright. Let me see. Where does, where, Wright says this in his book, Surprised by Hope. Paul declares that flesh and blood cannot inherit God's kingdom. He doesn't mean that physicality will be abolished. Okay, I'm just letting you see, when I tell you these things, it's not odd. Because I don't know what you think about me. I don't know when I say something, you may think, well, this guy just pulls stuff out of the air. He just makes up stuff. Maybe he had a stroke last night. <laughs> All right. He says he doesn't mean that physicality will be abolished. Flesh and blood is a technical term for that which is corruptible, transient, heading for death. The contrast again is not between what we call physical and what we call non-physical, but between corruptible physicality on the one hand and incorruptible physicality on the other. Now this just, it seems uh, quite clear, but what do I know? All right, this transformation, I want you to see this transformation, it is essential for everyone entering the eternal kingdom. See, not only for those who will, who, who've died before the second coming, 
This, whether this experience is death and is resurrected or whether this is here when Jesus comes, the transformation is necessary and essential for all who will enter that. Not all Christians will die. Some will be here when Jesus returns. You see, not all Christians, not all Christians will die, but all will be transformed. You see, all will be transformed. The body in its present form simply cannot inherit the eternal kingdom of God. Instead, when Christ returns, the dead will be raised with transformed, with resurrection bodies, with bodies that have been immortalized, glorious, powerful, and corruptible, no longer subject to death. They will be raised that way when he comes, and the saints who are alive at that time will likewise be transformed, but in their case, they won't experience death. They too will be transformed, but they will be transformed from living into a resurrection type body, and those who are dead will be raised with a resurrection body. And this will occur, he says, in an instant twinkling of an eye. And this is the same idea that you see expressed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Now, Paul notes that when this occurs, that was the first bell, right? I'm, I'm still, okay. When, he says that when this occurs, death will have been swallowed up in victory. Do you see this resurrection? You see how central and important this is? Death will be swallowed up in victory. When? Has Christ won the victory over death? Yes, he has. But there is a finalization. There is a realization of that victory that takes place when he returns in the resurrection. He says when that occurs, death will be swallowed up in victory. And then, in Ho and then using Hosea 13, 14, he then taunts death in verse 55. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? This thing that haunted mankind from the fall, this endless mouth that gobbled human beings up and just was never satisfied, this great enemy always lurking, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. This thing that consumed, waited on the horizon for everyone, where is your victory? Who kicked your teeth in? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ did that. And that's what Paul is saying here. Death has been defeated. It has been rendered impotent by the Lord Jesus. The victory that he gained at his first coming, as you see in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, it's now realized in the fullest sense in the immortalization of his people. And having mentioned death and sting, this is interesting, where Paul, he then interjects a theological note that the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law and what I think he means is that physical death let me give me just a second physical death it only really stings for those who are in sin for those who are under condemnation because of rebellion against the law of God see for them it really stings because for them, death is the entrance into an eternal judgment. But for the righteous, for the forgiven, for the victorious in Christ, death is stingless. It is stingless. It is a passage to a blessed intermediate state and then resurrection glory. You see, that's what I think Paul's doing. Anyway, 1 Corinthians 15, if I haven't done it justice... Go read it and study it. I mean, it's glorious, glorious. Thanks for coming.